What do you do? I mean, do do? punch the guy at punch. the free throw line in the stomach. Are they frowned upon that? Welcome to the second New York Sports Nation podcast from the Perk 11 Sports Department. Hi, above 42nd Street in the heart of New York City. I'm your host, Todd Ehrlich, the executive producer of the PIX11 Sports Department. They came back after week one. We weren't sure they <laughs> would, but we're thrilled they did. Two number one picks from the big, bad, big East back in the day when they ruled college basketball. The all-time leading scorer in Villanova history. The number one pick of the Nets. The number one selection for us here at PIX11, the great Kerry Kittle. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. Pretty good. Thank you. I wrote that all, all, all by myself. I'm so sorry. The man who wore number 44 in Syracuse Orange now has that number hanging from the rafters in the Carrier Dome as one of their all time greats. He's also one of our all time greats, the equally great John Wallace. <laughs> Appreciate it, Todd. Thank you, man. <laughs> so you as you know, Todd. Um, they, of course, are the stars of Big Apple Ball, airing Thursdays on Pix 11, by the way. Uh, feel free to set your DVRs. And you know what? Since you have your DVR remote in your hand, 11 o'clock, Sunday nights, on the same Pix 11, New York Sports Nation. Feel free to DVR. That's that. it? Yeah. Do the whole season. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, okay. So now that the promotional portion of the show is out of the way, we have two more folks to introduce to you. They also came back for week two. They had no choice to get a paycheck. They work here. <laughs> From the PIX11 Sports Department, Misery and the Moose. Oh, I like it. There you go. Like What's it. going on, I'm Todd? How are you? I'm fine, thank you. I appreciate you asking. I'm thinking we might have like a radio show something. Yeah, there you go. That's it. Sari and the Moose. I like. I wrote that myself <laughs> also. Um, so now let, let's get to basketball. Um, and a serious topic. So Ben Simmons missed uh, the year in Philadelphia, citing mental health issues as a reason behind him not playing for the Sixers. Thursday night, he is a proud member of the Brooklyn Nets, who we cover here on Picks 11, and he will not be playing. However, the Nets have decided to put him on the bench. Um, Kerry, you played in Philadelphia. You know that they eat their young there. You know <laughs> that in the vet, they had a jail because Philly fans can be unruly. Does this sound like a good idea to s subject him to that kind of abuse? Um, I, I think, listen, if, eventually he's going to have to stare those fans in the eyes, whether it's him in the uniform or, or, or in street clothes. And I, I think this is a start, right? You don't want him walking in that building as a foe um, for, you know, a real foe for the first time. Uh, in uniform, if you have a chance. I mean, for a guy that's been sort of mentally uh, fragile, let's just be, be called it that for now. Um, so, yeah, him being on the bench, staring the fans in the eye, a little bit of fan engagement, I think is good for his soul right now because if the Nets advance and meet the Sixers in the playoffs, you want Ben to be comfortable being in that environment, not having stepping there the first time, catching all that heat. John, you think he gets a you think he gets a tribute video? Doc Rivers <laughs> talking about the very fact uh, that that he thinks he will. Do you think he gets a tribute video Thursday night? I mean, he might, but the Philly fans are going to boo it. They might tear the screen down if it's while it's playing. So I don't I don't know if that's a good idea to try to play a tribute video. Um, just let bygones be bygones. They both sides have moved on. Just put the whole Ben Simmons, James Harden thing behind behind everyone and get ready for basketball because that's at the end of the day that's what it's all about is playing playing a sport that we all love so whether they boo him whether they do a a, a tribute video or not it, it's not going to change the, the the most important part aspect of it of this all is playing basketball and trying to get Ben back out on the court as soon as possible I got to know from your guys perspective how much does booing by the fans actually impact you out there on the court? Is it motivating? Does it help you well, out there? Does it depend on well, the player? How do you guys view it? It's great on the road because you get, you get a chance to keep shutting them up. There's nothing better than rowdy fans going crazy and you hit a basket to shut them up. 
So, um, you know, that, that from a being on the road and trying to go in as like the villain, so to speak, is, is good to, you know, to shut the crowd up. But the booze and all that, nothing, that doesn't affect you. You're, you're locked in and you're, and you're focused on the game once you step on that court. So, John, what was it like for you? You played for the Knicks and you went to Toronto the second year. When you came back and played for the Raptors in Madison Square Garden, were you fired up? Was there a lot of pressure on you? What was the uh, emotions like? I was definitely fired up. I wanted to have a good game. I wanted to, to prove to them that they made a mistake in trading me. So definitely was fired up. I played good that game. Um, but there definitely was a little bit, you know, a little extra – umph to the game uh, to when you play against your former team. Gary, does it, it does it when you, and I think Ty was referencing, obviously Harden taking on his former team, going to be home on Thursday night, taking on the Nets. Gary, does it bother you or John, both of you guys want to get a reaction about the way Harden handled himself and forcing his way out of Houston, you know, and Brooklyn. Um, you know, I understand player empowerment in the NBA. We all love the drama. It leads to the popularity of the sport. But what about the fact of how hard in his handled situations and then all of a sudden you see an uptick in his performance in his new spot? It is amazing. It is amazing how going to a, a new venue can help you play so much better. <laughs> well, he, he gave up. I mean, he gave Houston all he can give them. They, 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 they reached a point where they just couldn't make any more moves that was going to improve the team. Um, it exhausted every avenue they possibly could. He, uh, you know, it, it ran its course in Houston. So I don't think he forcing himself out of Houston was a bad thing because there was nothing left there uh, for him to try to win games. In terms of what happened in, with, with Brooklyn, um, um, you know, I think last year he, he was playing well and then he got injured and then he came in this year and he just didn't expect the, you know, KD and Kyrie to be gone and him just carrying the load again. That's what he was trying to avoid. That's what he, that's why he left Houston because it was just him. It was him or bus. But, I, I I'm I'm not sure who his chef is or who who his chef is or a dietitian <laughs> is, but in the last three weeks he's gotten a nice felt felt figure, and I'm not sure like like where was that in, like a month ago? He he was looking like the kid guy who didn't really care and was just you know strolling up and down the court, and now he's got this newfound energy, looking very vibrant for the uh, for the Sixers and playing you know, really high-level basketball, even on the de defensive end, which has always been his Achilles heel. So he's, he's even playing defense, and Doc's got them guys playing really good. So, uh, you know, hats off to him. You know, he, he's definitely to be commended. Uh, I, I don't – I don't. You, the, the NBA is a player's league, and that's the way it should be because the players make it go. So uh, players having the same power as owners or, or GM that can trade you anytime is, is the way the league should be, I feel. Yeah, and, and to piggyback off of that, to go, I, listen, I, I, I think we, we find out a lot about players when they're in losing situations, right? It's, you know, you're having to, to shoulder the burden every night and you're a really good player. That becomes exhausting. And or you're part of an organization where you can tell that management is just not capable. They're making the wrong decisions. They're bringing in the wrong guys. You have the wrong coaching staff, whatever the case may be. So Harden is just one of those players. You put him in a situation where there's, a chance to succeed and advance and do well, he's motivated. I mean, he commits more. He gives more of himself. He's locked in, right? We're Gary was running guys. the stairs the other night after a game. I mean, did you see that? I mean, what was he doing that in Brooklyn? I mean, he's just he's just motivated. But then you put him with Brooklyn, and there's so many questions, right? There's questions about, you know, the. I think he was questioning Steve Nash, you know, because he took a nice little jab at Nash when he got traded. Now he was obviously, what's going on with Kyrie? Is he committed to winning? Like, what's what we, he doesn't want to play in these games. I mean, and then there you just saw just the energy just zap out the young man, and he just wasn't motivated to, to be himself. And he's out there once again with rookies and Patty Mills and, and, and Lamarcus Aldridge, and he's going, What happened to Katie and Kyrie? So it's like, I think he's just one of those players where he has to be on a winning team or, or a chance to win and for him to be for him to be all locked in. And Kevin Durant kind of addressed that after last night's game. He came out and he said, you know, I can kind of understand James with all the uncertainty around myself and Kyrie going over there. Were you surprised that KD kind of took that approach? Because he had been heavily critical. We saw the shady threw at him during that all-star draft, not picking him up on the team. Are you surprised by his tone? 
No, I'm not surprised. KD is KD is pretty mature about things like that, and he, you know, he he's he's pretty reflective, you know, on, on things, and he likes to take things, you know, look at the whole and not just judge. He doesn't really judge people, so I'm not surprised that he he was able to look at that situation for what it really is. Is a lot of, like you said, a lot of uncertainty with the Nets prior to to what we're seeing right now, and and. You know, I mean, hopefully Kyrie is, is is fully committed now, and 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 everything gets better for the for the Nets. I don't know. He dropped uh, half of a Wilt Chamberlain <laughs> last night, so I think Kyrie's fairly committed with the fifty points. But I don't know. That's just me. So, um, listen, Kerry, you played in back to back NBA Finals. You know about pressure. What do you expect out of the beard tomorrow night, national TV? And he kind of has something to prove. Is he going to play better or worse? How will pressure affect him? And that, that dude is built for pressure. I mean, we can criticize him for taking plays off at times. I, I was very critical of the turnovers, watching him in Brooklyn. I mean, he was just throwing the ball all over the place, you know. But I, he's a competitor, man. I mean, James Harden's a competitor. And I know he had his, some playoff woes down in Houston, but I would attribute that to to you know, a lot of pressure being on him, be, him being the only guy. I, I think now he's he's he smells it now, and you're going to see a motivated Harden uh, tomorrow night. And I think the Nets are going to have their hands full with him because in, in ball screens, he's amazing. And one on one situation, you can't guard him one on one. So he's gonna he's gonna destroy guy. I, he's gonna have a big night for sure. John, how about the one-two combination? A lot of people have broken it down, looking at it in Bede and Harden, being able to play off one another. You know, it's called it, it said it's indefensible. When you watch those two on the court together, working there and doing their stuff uh, offensively, do you think it's impossible to deal with the one-two of, of Embiid and Harden defensively? It's definitely, definitely tough because um, you got to make a decision whether you're going to either blitz or try to get the ball out of Harden's hands. Then you're kicking it to Embiid and, it doesn't matter who's closing out, whether it's a guard or a big, they can't guard and be, um, you know, and especially when his jump shots fl- fall and he's, 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 you know, one of the toughest covers in the league. So um, it's, it, you got to, that's the conundrum that the league is in. Like, all right, what do you try to take away? Are you going to try to take away more of Harden and his drives to the bats? Or are you going to try to take away um, and be rolling and picking and popping and trying to pre-rotate as Kerry knows back in the day, um, the, the kind of way we played defense was you blitz the pick and roll, you pre-rotated, and the, the top of the eye picked up the first pass, and the bottom guy picked up the second pass. So, I mean, they might have to go to some old school type philosophies to try to slow them down because right now they have it rolling and they're, they're playing good defensively. And Maxi is like their – he stepped up to be their third their, – their third, their third of the big three. You thought it was going to be Tobias Harris, but thus far has been more so – uh, Maxi, in terms of his scoring outbursts and the energy, he just comes in and just that youthful exuberance that we all that you know. Once you get to our age, you kind of miss that just happy go lucky. I mean, he's just out there balling, man. So uh, it, you know, the, the Sixers are a really, really tough team. They they definitely got a lot better with uh, James Harden. Who knew that the process really meant we were going to get Joel Embiid and James Harden? And Maxi, there, uh, all these years later on, it may finally be coming to fruition. I'm curious, guys, because you mentioned the motivation for James Harden here. How motivated are KD and Kyrie in this one to go in there and show the guy who jumped ship saying, I'm uncertain that you guys can help me win a championship here to go out there and say, you made the wrong decision? I don't know. I, I think they'll be motivated to compete. But I, I still think that they're not whole with, with Ben Simmons. And so I, I think, you know, you're going into a battle like that without one of your key cogs. That, that's not going to be, you know, in the back of your mind, you're thinking, okay, we lose, it doesn't matter. We don't have, you know, it's not a playoff game, first of all, in playoff series, and we don't have Ben Simmons in the lineup. So I, I think they'll be motivated to play well. They need, they need to play well because they don't want to be in that play that playing game. Can they get to that sixth spot with only, I think it's, 16 games remaining. That's going to be a tough task for the Nets. Um, but they'll be ready to compete for sure. Not even that. They got Charlotte right on their heels there, that if they drop down to the ninth seed in there, then they're going to have to win two games just to get into the actual playoffs. Right now they're sitting at eighth. Um, I mean, Philadelphia is second in the East right now, basically tied with the Bucs. Um, do you think that going into Philadelphia for um, Kyrie coming off this 50-point game – is something that he's because he was questioned by Harden that 
he'll go and, and he'll have more motivation to show out rather than KD? No, I think I think Kyrie's motivated. He doesn't need Harden or any other extra uh, incentive to, to to go and play the game he loves. And, you know, Kyrie's super motivated because he doesn't get to play in all the games as, as of right now. So, you know, when, when you're only playing one or two games here and there sporadically, you, you can't wait to get a chance to have that chance to play. So he's going to take full advantage of that. He's not going to make it a personal uh, agenda type game him versus James Harden. He just got to come out and do the best for his team and for the Nets trying to get a win. I mean, you know, coming off 50 point game, he best believe he's going to be looking uh, uh, to either duplicate that or, or top it, you know, in the Sixer game. What do you guys think about Curry and, and Drummond? I mean, obviously going back to Philly, they're sort of overshadowed, but they're important to the Nets, certainly in the stretch run and into the playoffs. How do you think that they've been fitting in and what do you expect out of them? Yeah, no, they're, they're definitely key pieces to what the Nets have moving forward. They need that de defensive rebounding presence from Drummond um, and, and hopefully he can get them a little bit more offense. And, and listen, the shooting and the spacing on the court in today's game is what, is what Seth Curry gives the Nets. And, and at an opportune times where you can give him the ball and allow him to, to work the pick and roll and, and, and be a little bit more of a creator and, and stuff like that, just to be more aggressive, take pressure off Katie and Kyrie. Listen, they're, they're important. They need those two guys to, to play big for them. I mean, they're, they're, not, they're not as deep as people think the Nets are. I mean, they're, they're top heavy for sure. You know, as of, as of now, they're, they're, they're roster. And so Seth Curry has to play well. He has to make shots, um, as well as Drummond being an inside presence for them. Do you think Drummond, with his physicality, can slow down and beat it all? Or is he just on, on a tear? No. <laughs> Curry is shaking his head no, and cursing no. his MB legs. Right now, MB right now has raised his level up under Doc Rivers this year. I mean, he is a real MVP candidate, which means you can't stop him. You can't stop him. I mean, it doesn't matter who's guarding him. He's going to get 28, 29 points minimum. That's just how, that's how good he is. That's how effective he is. Drummond, it doesn't matter. Jokic. I mean, and, and beat is playing at a high level right now. Yeah, Kerry, I want to ask, uh, go back to the Kyrie conversation for a second, because, you know, you see this performance where he drops in 50. I think he joins Jordan, only guards in NBA history with 50 or more point games that have shot over 75%. His true, uh, you know, his true shooting percentage last night was over 100. I mean, he was unbelievable in his performance. But explain Kyrie, for those that, you know, never played the game, you know, that get frustrated, Kerry, by Kyrie Irving because it doesn't seem like he loves Ben. Ridiculously talented. We understand that. But doesn't seem to have the drive, the passion where basketball defines him. Explain Kyrie to really, you know, to the as mercurial as he might be, even as gifted of a basketball player as he is. Uh, this podcast is only a half hour, so do the best you can. <laughs> I'll be here all night. we we trying to figure out Kyrie, right? I, I listen. He's a very talented player. He's been around the game his entire life. His father played professionally, right? And so what, we, what we've seen since his high school and college years is an extremely gifted individual talent. I mean, there's, there's nothing other you can say. Dribbling the ball, his, his handle skills is the best, I think, ever. His combo moves and his counter moves, he's got more than anyone that's ever played the game. He's got, he goes right, left, he finishes, he pulls up, he's got three they're long distance, he does everything. But I think that's where in lies the problem. I think I the, the, the only other player I've seen that's close to Kyrie um, comparing him would be Vince Carter in the sense that you have immense talent, but there's just something that's missing. I don't, I don't know what it is. You call it motivation sometimes or lack of love for the game because they're just not, not like Kobe Bryant's passion, right? Like, I, I don't know what's missing. Maybe the game is just too easy for him. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I know when, when Vince Carter came to New Jersey, I, I, I asked, I asked uh, Jason Kidd, I said, what's up with Vince? And he goes, ah, it's too easy. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, ah, you'll see. It's just too easy. And I was like, <laughs> and I'm sure John can tell you, it was just that easy. He was just that talented of a player where he could just do anything. You're like, okay, fine. He doesn't have to come in and do extra work. He doesn't have to, like, spend extra time studying the game. He's just that naturally gifted. So Kyrie is in that category of elite players to play the game with the unique skill set where at times he doesn't seem as engaged or motivated to be a dominant force 
every single night. And I and, and who knows the reason why? We're gonna only speculate the reason why. Okay, so now the grudge match Thursday night, Nets at Sixers. John Wallace, who's gonna win and why? Then you carry. I think Philly's gonna win the game. Um, even though Kyrie will be able to play and, and, and KD's back now, the the Nets still, are, you know, they're not still not full of strength with, with Ben Simmons. And, and they still haven't, you know, played together enough to – they're not clicking yet. They're not – they're not looking – I mean, they, they look good last night against the Hornets, but they haven't looked good against the, you know, the better teams. And, they you know, the the game in Boston, you know, the, the, the top team that they're going to possibly be playing in the playoffs. So that's what they're trying to get ready for. Not, you know, and Philly's playing so well right now. There's, they're, they're extra motivated. Uh Obviously, because of the trade, but more importantly, they're they're motivated to position themselves to uh, make this real run for the title, and they're trying to get that top seed if they can. They've already slid up into the second second spot, and they're trying to you know to, to, to catch the, um, the the Miami Heat for the first seed. So that that's all the motivation you need. You don't even need to throw in the trade and all the other stuff. They they have a big goal in mind this year, and that's the championship. Kerry, do you have a better answer, please? <laughs> I, I can't. I can't top that. He, you know, listen. They're, they're, the Nets. No, 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 just pick a different team. <laughs> All you have to say is the Nets. You don't have to top the whole answer. But, well, the, the Nets are still they're trying to find their continuity since the trade. That that's the most important thing. I mean, with, with guys in and out of the lineups, um, that's been the challenge for Steve Nash and his coaching staff this whole season. Is is different lineups. You don't know who's going to play. Right. You, you, you just don't know. And so therein lies the problem with 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 them just reaching their full potential this year. We you know, we haven't seen them whole. Well, it's interesting. Like you, you look at, you know, kind of forecasts and look at excuses being made. Right. So we'll see when Simmons does play. Right. The You know, you still have Kyrie being a part time player. Obviously, Durant coming off the knee injury. John, I'll throw this question to you. There's no excuses now for Harden down in Philadelphia. He's in the spot he wanted to go. He's familiar in a general manager more. He's got the big man in Embiid. Uh, Kerry talked about Maxi. You've obviously you've got an unbelievable starting five. You know he struggled in the postseason, John. I mean, you want to talk about a pressure spot? I mean, all eyes. He wanted it. He's down there, but now it's time for James Harden to go win a championship. Yeah, and definitely all eyes are on him. Like. Like all eyes on me, like the old Tupac album. <laughs> it, it, it definitely eyes are on him right now. Um, you know, the fact that everyone thinks he, whatever, forced his way out of Houston, forced it so as he to spoil Brad. Well, you know, everyone was a little upset with Matt, Matthew Stafford that he left, you know, Detroit the way he did and that after all those years. But now he's a Super Bowl champion. And that, you know, you got to dare to be great. And I think. You know, with the movie made and, you know, with all the familiarity with Daryl Morey. And it's, it's so easily, uh, it's so easy to uh, get along with Doc Rivers. He's a, you know, incredible uh, coach, especially on the offensive side. So, you know, that's that's James Forte. But it, it's definitely for him and, the, and that city and that team, they're expected to win it all this year. Anything less would definitely be a huge disappointment. Um, to that city and, and the moves they've made and the, the sacrifices the, the, that the manager and everyone else has made to, to put together that type of team, um, the, the money that they've spent. So definitely is, 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 winner, is winner nothing for them. But don't you have to say the same thing about Brooklyn? I mean, Kyrie can opt out at the end of this season. I know they signed KD to the extension. Doesn't Brooklyn have to win a championship from the moves they made? Yeah, but Brooklyn is, you know, Brooklyn is still a brand new franchise. So it's like when Toronto Raptors, the Raptors won it. Like you wanted them to win it, but they didn't have to win it. It wasn't like it's the, you know, the, 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 the fans in the arena were going to stop. Like Philly, you know how, the, how rabid and passionate those fans are. If they come up short, you know, it could get ugly down there. So um, it's not the same expectations in terms of the, the, the story franchise like the Sixers are, you know, having won championships before and have, now not having won one in so long. So on um, the Nets, to, you know, the Brooklyn Nets have 
still brand new kind of. I know Gary played for the New Jersey Nets, which is, you know, completely different, you know, stadiums, all that stuff. So the Nets franchise, yes, has been to the finals, but uh, the Brooklyn Nets and this iteration of, of, of the Nets team have not. And I just don't think, you know, I think, I think that played into part of their decision to not go to the Knicks because it's definitely going to be more pressure in, in New York uh, for the Knicks as opposed to the, uh, um, the Nets. Um, John, I'm sorry. Um, Dr. J is on line two. He'd like to talk to you about the championship with the New York Nets, but we'll get back to that. Um, let's turn our attention to the New York Knickerbockers. Uh, the saga seems to continue with Julius Randle to roller coaster ride. First, the bad Sunday night, he gets charged, uh, fined, you know, a little walk around money, 50 grand by the NBA for not participating. It's Todd Ehrlich walk around yeah, it's money. walk around money for me. <laughs> um, not participating in the league's investigation to the tete-a-tete with his son's Cam Johnson. Then he comes out the next night on Monday. He's four short of Kyrie, which I know. You know, we had his eye on Kyrie's 50, but he still dropped a career-high 46 and a back-to-back win in Sacramento. Tomato. <laughs> what can they do to try to get Julius Randle to be consistent? Well, I think he's been consistent the last month, month and a half. I mean, look at his numbers over the last month. He's definitely been consistent. He's, he's been putting up really good numbers. Uh, I, I think people are confusing him being consistent with losing. Um, they've been losing, but it's not because he's not. he hasn't been consistent. He's been scoring a lot better, shooting a lot better. Um, playing a lot better basketball, as has um, um, R.J. Barrett. So uh, it, it doesn't fully fall on him. He just uh, – some, some, some nights he hasn't had the, the, the requisite help that he needs. Um, you know, but, you know, for, for someone to say that, you know, I can understand the way he started the season because he just started as strong as last year. But over the last month or so and a little bit longer, to say that Julius Randle hasn't been playing consistently or good is – it's just not the truth to me. I mean, you just got to look at his numbers. As we all say, numbers don't lie, and his numbers have definitely been stronger over the last uh, month, month and a half. I'll go back to February 10th to back up your point there. We got 28 points on February 10th, 28, 30, 31, 11, and 16, then 24, 25, 10, and 46 for him. So he's been scoring. He's just making up numbers, folks. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm looking at it. He's not lying. I'm looking at the same number. Thank you. Uh, K- Kerry, what, it, you know, Dream scenario, right? Obviously, the, this team is sitting four and a half games back of the play-in tournament in the Eastern Conference. But, you know, if you are the Knicks after this season, you look at Barrett, you look at Randall. not talking about the fact of whether or not you're trading Julius Randle, but everyone wants a big three. Where would you place those two in kind of a, a Knicks big three? Do you think Barrett's good enough to be a one, Randall a three, and you're looking for that secondary star? What do you think the Knicks need to do when they look at their two foundation pieces they have right now? Oh man, um, they're they're definitely in that top three. Both of those guys for for a, a winning franchise with a chance to win it all to compete. That third player, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I like for that third player to be like like a, a um, I don't know, Damian Lillard type player. Yeah, they need a lead guard. Carry they is need what a they lead need. guard. They need a lead combo guard that's that's you know an electric score. That's what they need. I mean, you, 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 every team that's winning now have one of those guards for the most part. They have a guard who they can give the ball to and sit back and watch them just give teams headaches, you know. And so they don't have that now. They don't have that luxury. And so, um, you know, the, with the pick and roll game right now being so prevalent, the dribble handoff game, the switching, and then a guard that can break down anybody that switches on them, you know, that's that's what most teams are using right now as a, as a, a advantage. The, the Knicks don't have that luxury, so can they go find that in the market this summer? I, I, I don't know. You know <laughs> I'm sure they're going to try their best, but it's, it's not as easy as it once was for that franchise to go out there on the market and to handpick that, that high-caliber, talented player. Let me ask you something, because we just throw it out there all the time, and I think we take it for granted a little bit about the idea of a big three. Do you think you can truly have a big three exist in the NBA? Because – I feel like on certain nights, a guy can step up here and there. But when you look at Miami, which kind of started this whole thing, Bosch wasn't the same player that he was in Toronto. His role had to change, and he had to take a step back a little bit. And he was willing to do that. 
a slight step back, but you definitely could use three dominant guys because if those one of those guys don't have a great night going, they have a bad matchup in one series. Right. Is the best part about doing things yourself? <laughs> it's free. Okay, what happened there? I don't know, but it's free. It's obviously, free. we can get the third yeah. of the big three. They're free. That's it. Um, so, obviously, RJ and Randall were good enough on the left coast to win back-to-back -back games against the uh, Kings and the paper clips. They're four and a half behind the Hawks. John, are they going to catch Atlanta? Yes. Uh, you know, I, I, I think the Knicks, everyone kept sleeping on their defense, which is still, like, in the top ten. Um, the offense, as long as their offense is playing good, and RJ and, and Randall right now have become a very formidable one-two punch. So uh, with, with team trying to game plan for them, and those guys have both been very unselfish with the basketball. Quickly, he's been shooting very well the last couple of games, 20, uh, scoring over 20 in uh, two, two games. So the 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 – the, the chance of the Knicks making this run is right now. They got they won their last two. I've said all along they they need a five, six, seven game winning streak to to to, to sneak into the playoffs, and I, and I think that's what it's going to take. And that's what they're trying to uh, uh, continue on right now. Right now on the on the West Coast trip is uh, the build on those two wins from the last from the last two games. You know, John, we we spent a lot of time talking about kind of the the with the Knicks, the younger players getting burned. Um, reference a conversation I had with, you know, a guy that you guys know well, Brian Scalabrini, who knows Thibodeau real well and talked about the fact that, you know, comes down to practice habits. You know, John, you know Tibbs real well. Everyone gets frustrated I when healthy. I know some of the young guys now are banged up when you look at Obi, you look at Cam Reddish. When the young guys are healthy, how do you work your way? Because Thibodeau's made it perfectly clear. you got to earn it. How do you work your way into the trust of Tom Thibodeau? Well, Kerry can tell you this. You got to, when, when you're a guy that's not playing or, uh, you know, trying to earn more minutes, you got to treat your practices like they're the games. You got to really come to like what you're serious. Let's get it in every day in practice. That's the only way a coach going to trust you. That's the only way you can see what you're really about. And that's the only way your teammates going to trust you is your practice habit. Because the teams that are really good, the best players practice the hardest. That's just how it is. And everyone else falls in line. Either you practice hard or you, you know, you're not going to make it in that culture. So um, it, it definitely always starts to practice. And I'm, I, you see the young guys have been playing lately. Huh? So then I'm, I'm sure that McBride and those guys have been practicing hard and uh, getting after it all year. It's just that sometimes you have, you have guys that are a little bit better in front of you that, you know, get mo the – bulk of the minutes, especially when you're young, a young player in the league. But the, the important, the important, uh, the important, the most important thing in that is even when you're not playing, is keeping a positive mindset, keeping that strong, strong work ethic and staying ready because at any given moment, your, your name, number could be called and you must be ready. Seem to work for Michael Jordan in Chicago. I think you're onto something, John. Um, <laughs> Kerry jumping at the bit there. Well, what's up, Kerry? No, I was just add to what he's saying. I think, you know, a lot of these younger players in the NBA, you know, they come into the league in, in, in this modern era with just a lot of talent. And they don't have that work ethic and that 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 coaches like Tibbs is demanding. And that and therein lies the problem with a lot of these teams is that you have these coaches and these and these coaches where they're gonna work you overtime. It's that blue collar mentality. And a lot of these kids just don't have that. They come in, they're younger, they just have all this talent. But they're not used to working three hours a day of real grind plus, you know, and, and then be ready to play in case your number is called. That's a lot to ask for these young guys. And, so and who's who's got to change then, Kerry? The players or the coaches in that? I think that both. Scenario? I think both have to change. I think players have to understand that in order to improve, you have to put in the work, and and that's what it takes at that level. And but that's a you're asking a lot for a 21 year old kid who's just not used to pushing himself that hard because the game has never been that hard for them. But now it is. You're seeing guys like Cam Reddish. You're seeing, even though he's an immensely talented player, it is tough to be able to, to break these lineups on a good team and to prove to certain coaches that you're ready to play and that you can be reliable. And, and the coaching staffs that have this, this old-school culture 
have to also bend and, and meet these players and, and walk them through their process a little bit more gingerly so that they don't go the other way and say, I can't take this, just trade me. You know, I don't want to be here. This is just not for me. So it takes it takes both sides coming together and buying in and saying, this is what it's going to take. Okay, I'm committed to doing whatever it takes as long as we're all on the same page. All right, so speaking of young players, let's finish with this. First, John, then you, carry. Let's take a look down a level. College basketball, you guys both love your schools. John, I know you were at the Q's game today. I think they played okay. What do you expect? <laughs> what do you expect out of your orange the rest of the way? And then Carrie, what do you expect out of your cats the rest of the way? And then both you give us a uh, a champion, NCAA finals champion. John, you start. Well, first of all, uh, we have a uh, our hands full tomorrow. We have Duke at noon. That's going to be a tough call order for the for the Cubs team. Uh, they can play any way near the, the, the way they play today in terms of offensive flow, moving the ball. Because we all know that Florida State, they, they, they struggle on offense sometimes, but they always play good defense. And uh, Syracuse was, you know, shredding them up today. So definitely need that kind of offensive output and energy tomorrow against Duke. Uh, in terms of who's going to win it this year, this might be the most – Parity in college, uh, the college basketball has had in a really, really long time. There's like 12 teams or so that can win it. There's been so, so many teams that have been that that's that's been number one. No one really just was the most, you know, just dominant team all year. Um, Gonzaga's good, Baylor's good. Uh, you know, so if, if I had to, if I was forced to pick a team that I feel like would that could possibly win it all. I don't, I don't think Baylor's going to repeat, but I, I don't think Gonzaga has enough uh, to, to, to win it either. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go with like, you know, a UCLA team. They have a young, tough point guard and Ticket Campbell. They're, they're good. You know, they play tough defense. Cronin's a great coach. Uh, they made it to the final four last year. So, John, what you're saying is my Maryland Terrapins in a wide open field have a chance after <laughs> they make a run through the Big Ten tournament. I really appreciate that. We got you on the record for that. <laughs> Carrie, <laughs> Carrie, what do you think about your cats and then who's going to win this thing? Yeah, my, my cats are, are, are a solid team this year. I don't think that they have those go to punches that, that they had in the past that carried them to a Final Four run, but they'll be competitive. I think they'll definitely make the Sweet 16. They'll be, they'll be competitive. Um, but I, I like the Arizona Wildcats this year. They've, they've done really well, um, especially in, in, in conference play. Um, and they're number two in the country right now. And they, they, they have a big and they have some depth. So uh, I, I like the, I like the uh, Arizona Wildcats. So uh, I'd like to close on this. I'd like to thank you guys for coming. John, thank you so much for giving me and my Turtle fans everywhere hope. Um, <laughs> You, Sari and the Moose, they thank no you so shot. much. They Carrie no and shot. John, yeah. thank you so much, Moose. You're fired. Uh, if either one of you guys want to co host the show this week, we now have an opening. Uh, thank you so much for listening to New York Sports Nation. Fear the Turtle. Todd, I'm very upset. I now know what KPIs are. You do? You now know? Yeah. What show I was watching. Key performance indicators ruined it for me. <laughs>